Welcome to One Mind Zen. Tonight's Dharma talk is given by Hangdal Chita. When last we left our intrepid Sid, he had uh, walked away from a number of Zen teachers and temples kind of in disgust. He went on another long journey and he found himself in a in a coffee shop in California and went in to get a cup and happened to see Alan Watts sitting in a corner smoking his pipe and Sid thought, huh, he's not one of those Zen masters, but he's written a lot of books. I'm going to go ask him. So he went, sat down, he said, Alan, I've, I've, I've read a bunch of your books and I, I just have to ask because I'm really tired of Zen teachers, Zen masters. They're always saying stupid things and riddles and paradoxes and nobody will give you a straight answer about anything. What do you think is the core teaching, the essence of Buddhism? Alan said, Suzuki says the core is everything changes. Said so, okay, great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything changes. I know. I meditate. I see it. I watch inside. I watch outside. Watch the mind. Watch things. Watch my breath. It's like watching a lava lamp. It's just bubbling around. I know. Everything's changing. It's always changing. What do I do with that? Perhaps the next step is finding a way to dig change. Hmm. Dig change. Sid thought about that for a minute, and he's like, so you mean kind of shit happens and that's okay? Shit happens, and that's cool. Actually, Alan Watts talked a lot about Japanese aesthetics. And uh, an actual quote from him is, Yugen is a way of digging change. Yugen is the, the mystery word. It, it's made up of two characters, and it's like deep and mysterious or something like that. I forget exactly the, the hanji, but... Uh, Profound, mysterious, subtle, inexpressible beauty. So our, our assignment right now is to talk about our, our favorite sutra, and that's that's where I'm leading into here. My favorite is the Diamond Sutra. It is the one that, that I have returned to over and over and over again. Um, I, I think it's the core of Dogen's Teachings and thoughts, particularly items like the Ginja Khan, I think it's, well, it's obviously the core of Huineng and his Platform Sutra. But we're supposed to break this down and just pick one little section. So I went with the obvious. I picked the, the very last section, the, the verse that the Buddha speaks at the end of the Diamond Sutra. So let me read this to you. A little while and I will be gone from among you, whither I cannot tell. From nowhere we came into nowhere we go. What is life? It is a flash of a firefly in the night. It is a breath of a buffalo in the winter time. It is as the little shadow that runs across the grass and loses itself into the sunset. So that's not from the Diamond Sutra. That's a Blackfoot Nation elder by the name of Crowfoot from his address to his people before he died. So now I'll give you the Buddha's verse. So I say to you, this is how to contemplate our conditioned existence in this fleeting world. Like a tiny drop of dew or a bubble floating in a stream, like a flash of lightning in a summer cloud or a flickering lamp, an illusion, a phantom, or a dream. 
so is all conditioned existence to be seen. I find those two verses remarkably, amazingly similar. And those two verses and the traditions they come from inform what has led to or become sort of the practice that I wish I were better at doing. Like I said, the Diamond Sutra, I've, I've gone to it over and over again. It's, it's profoundly important. I read it when I'm feeling good and when I'm feeling bad. And the essence of the teaching, like the essence of many of the native ways of approaching life and balance in the circle is, Everything changes. Nothing is permanent. Nothing is fixed. You can grasp nothing. Not yourself. Not your concepts, your ideas, your loves, your hatreds. It's a flowing thing. It's a moving thing. There's another great Japanese aesthetic term, um, furio, which is the flowing of the wind or the flowing of what flows. So what are these subtle flowings? Is it is it a darkness? Is it a despair? Absolutely not. Observing the world is impermanent in the Buddhist way is to express a joy, a peace, and a hope based upon that impermanence. The change is happening, whether we want it to or not, whether we acknowledge it or not, whether we embrace it or not, we can paint our windows black and close our eyes to the world, and that stops not a thing inside us or externally in the world. So what we can do is embrace it. And the Buddhist way of embracing is not to go, oh, woe is me. Okay, yeah, shit happens. I'll just trudge on and paste a fake smile on my face and fake it until I make it. Our way is, and it reflects the moon. The bubble floating in the stream is that piece of water that you can never step in twice. The flash of lightning is the Vajra, the diamond lightning insight that illuminates everything for a moment. The flickering lamp is that, that interplay between light and dark. Lighting our way, showing the darkness. As we say in our verse, infinite realms of light and dark. All of these things are a joy, a hope, an embrace. They're not a despair, dread, doom. And I feel like some people, when they first get into Buddhism and they first start reading things like this, take a very dim view that it's some kind of nihilistic thing. And it certainly, like anything else, can turn into that. But the idea is that looking at these things, at the fleetingness of life, at the fleetingness of experience of any self we think we have, is that any sense of doom is only there if we're trying to hold on to that fleetingness. Otherwise, we are the phantom, the dream, the illusion, the flickering light. So when we walk out into the world, when we approach the many beings that we swear to save, when we approach all the Dharma gates we're going to enter and all the delusions we're going to uproot, we don't go out and say to everybody, oh, life sucks, but it's okay, I'm a Buddha, so I'm, I'm cool with it, I'm down with that. We say, wow, look at that floating bubble in the stream. 
Look at the autumn leaf that's just getting ready to fall. This is life, just as surely as it is in the beginning of spring when those first green shoots appear on the tree branches that are going to become leaves. It's that hopefulness that we engage the sentient beings with. That there's a way to step outside of ourselves and embrace this beauty and this joy in the change because we've stepped out of ourselves and they can step out of themselves and we can leave the trials and all that other crap behind that's a result of clinging and just keep flowing. And show, even if we're not act actively teaching, show the example of embracing that change in a way that says, I don't have to suffer through this because I'm embracing it. And that also doesn't mean we, we accept things that could be different. We try to do good deeds, cease from evil, do good, purify the mind, the whole the whole little trifecta there from, from the Dhammapada. But even those, those attempts, those good deeds are conditioned upon impermanence. Those deeds will pass away like everything else into the ether that is just life as it is. So I'll leave you with... with a last kind of thought on this, because I, I mentioned the other bodhisattva vows, and, and this is one that has become part of my little koan or, or pladu. I've spent a lot of time with the bodhisattva vows, and, and you know, the, the first three are kind of static, more or less. You know, you have a variation here and there. Sentient beings are numberless everywhere, countless. We're going to do something with them, about them, for them. Delusions are endless. We're going to uproot them, fix them, see through them. Teachings, dharma, endless. We're going to embrace them, do them, learn them, embody them. But we get to the fourth. And I mean, in all of you have been practicing this way for a long time. Start making a list of the fourth great bodhisattva vow. The Buddha way is blank. What? Unsurpassable, endless, highest, supreme, incomparable, incomprehensible, beyond comprehension, inconceivable, endless, profound, subtle, ineffable, indescribable, incapable, sublime, lofty, outstanding, transcendent. I vow to what? Because... The Buddha way, like the Tao, like Yugen, like this final verse of the Diamond Sutra, is not concrete. It's not graspable. It's not definable. It's not, you can use all kinds of words and point to all kinds of things. But the Buddha way is according oneself to contemplating conditioned existence in this fleeting world. So what do we say about the Buddha way? Well, we vow to something. I kind of like the, the way we put it, the, the Buddha way is endless. And I saw a real, real neat one that, that goes along with the impermanence and the stream and the flow and the little koan of what we all do. The Buddha way is endless. I vow to follow it to the end. <laughs>